Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, thought we'd uh, take a break from the question and answers and get to the third salvation for the, our, our series of salvations, the three salvations. Okay, you got salvation, go over it again real quick. You've got salvation that's eternal salvation. Okay, when you go from being a lost, hell-bound sinner to a saved sinner, and we talked about it, we went through all the parts of the plan of salvation, you know. It, we talked about it being like a road map. There's instructions. If you want to make it to your destination, there's instructions on how to find God's grace. And you go through repentance. You go through belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You confess both in prayer. You ask God to save you. And after God saves you, there's a changed life. Okay, that was the first salvation. Okay, He saves you from the law of sin and death. He saves you from hell. Okay, that's the first salvation. The second salvation we talked about was salvation in this life as a Christian. Okay, he saved you from the law of sin and death, but in this life as a Christian, he's going to start saving you from the law of sin, because we're still under the law of sin. He's going to start cleaning up your life. He's going to start changing your life. He's going to start protecting you. Okay, there's going to be chastisement. You want, uh, that's why the Bible talks about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In this life, salvation in this life, how you live a life of Christ for the Lord, the rewards you get, what you're going to lose, how much you're going to lose, how much you're going to gain, okay? That's determined in this life that you live as a Christian, okay? The changed life after salvation. The third salvation, okay, uh, if you've seen the title of this video, it's Caught Up. Okay, we're going to talk about the third salvation where we're going to be freed from the law of sin we're going to be freed from this wicked world. We're going to be freed from this wicked body of flesh. Okay. So, first thing we're going to talk about is caught up in soul. Make sure you have your King James Bibles out and that you're following along. There's a lot of scripture to go through, so I have them all typed up here. But make sure you have your King James Bible out. And if you're new to the ministry, what I used to do when I followed people like Brother Brian, uh, Brother JT, and some of the other brethren, um, I'd pause the video, and then you turn, and then unpause the video. And then pause, turn, because I'm a slow turner. I really am. And I'm a slow reader. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's why I, I love listening to Alexander Scorvey and following along. It kind of helps speed up my reading to be, keep up with somebody. But turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. The first salvation, the third salvation, has two parts. But ultimately, it, it comes down to one. But we're going to talk about a part that comes before it real quick, okay? Caught up in soul. Notice I didn't say body and soul. It said soul. Caught up in soul. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Someone who dies and goes to heaven. Such a one will I glory. Yet of myself will I not glory, but in my infirmities. Here's Paul, and we're going to get to it. Go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 25. This is, I believe, is talking about Paul. Okay? But what he's talking about is you have someone who dies on the earth. The Bible, we're going to, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the Bible talks about sleeping. There's Christians who sleep. It's talking about the dead in Christ. And that the catching away of the body of Christ, who comes up first? The dead in Christ come up first. The ones who are sleeping. Okay? But your soul gets caught up. 2 Corinthians 11.25 says, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. This is Paul. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, and a night and a day I have been in the deep. That's why I believe it's talking about Paul. Paul was stoned to death and taken outside the city and thrown outside the city and left for dead. And God gave him a glimpse. I mean, think about this, brother and sister Christ. He got a glimpse. You know how hard it was for Paul to stay here and how much love he had for the brethren, knowing what was waiting for him? That's hard, okay? But we're going to get into scriptures where he talks about but being here is more needful for you, okay? But Paul, I believe it was talking about Paul being stoned to death, and 
and God gave him a glimpse of being caught up so he can explain it to us what it's like to be caught up before the time of Jacob, I'm talking about before the catching away of the time of Jacob's trouble, when a Christian dies, what happens? His soul goes to heaven. It doesn't go to hell, it doesn't go to Abraham's bosom, it goes to heaven. Okay? He gets released from this body of flesh. He gets saved, the third salvation, from this wicked body of flesh. God says, you've done the good job, you've fought the good fight. Remember how Paul used to talk? I don't have this in this, the notes, but how he used to talk to Timothy at the end, where it's like, he knows his time is near, his time is over, he's about to go be with the Lord. He's fought the good fight. God looks at Christians all down through the centuries. You fought the good fight, it's time to come home. It's time to, that you don't have to deal with that wicked body of flesh anymore. You don't have to deal with the wicked world anymore. Come on home. There's times I believe that he can kill a Christian early because you're making so much mess and you're messing around in the flesh and just making a mess of your life. And the Bible says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Okay? That goes for saved and lost. Okay? You can make such a mess of your life with sin, sin, sin that God will kill you and bring you home early. It's not the same thing as him saying, well done, you, done, you fought the good fight, come on home. Okay? Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. When we're alive on this earth, we're supposed to be living for Jesus Christ. But when we die to go to be with the Lord, it's far better. It's a gain. When we have a brother or sister in Christ pass away and die, we mourn their death, we miss our friend, we miss our brother and sister in Christ. But don't forget where they're at right now. They're in a better place than here. Gain. Okay. Verse 22, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choo shall choose I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Brother and sister Christ, the reason we're here and not up there, after, when you get saved, the reason you don't get just taken right up right away is because there's work for you to do for the Lord. Uh, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ, for witnessing, for t testifying uh, the gospel. We're here to encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ to keep walking and keep doing the same. Get that last soul saved. Okay? Paul's talking about it's far better to be up there. He's in a strict between two, to be here for the body of Christ or to be up there. But you know who makes that decision? God does. Paul, I'm not done with you yet, raises him up and says, get back to work. And he gets back to work, serving the Lord, preaching truth, preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Turn to Ephesians 2.1. Remember, to die is gain. This whole study is about being caught up. You can get caught up today in, in soul only, or you can get caught up today in body and soul if, if we live to see the catching away of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that spirit, we keep preaching this, brother and sister Christ, that Antichrist spirit is in the world today. Okay? It's out there, that false Jesus that's being preached, that you can have the world. Notice it talks about here, dead and trespassed sin, where in the times past you walked according to the course of this world. How many professing Christians do we know out there that still walk according to the course of this world? According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. They look like the world, they act like the world, they talk like the world, they're people pleasers. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. Uh, the Bible also says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That's out there. We're seeing that, and we're vexed by it. They're hindering the work that we're trying to do. But don't get me wrong. If someone's truly seeking the truth, I've had testimonies after testimonies how people have found my channel, how people have found Brother Brian's channel, Brother JT's channel, Brother Brad Abishine's channel, the Brethren's channels. 
And some people have amazing testimonies on how they found him. I got a letter from somebody over in Great Britain, a brother in Christ from Great Britain, that he talked about how he just typed in, is God real? He was truly seeking truth, and God brought him to all these Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of fakes and frauds out there. We're set apart. Verse 3, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Past tense. That's, I remember other times in Scripture, you got to read it, where it tells us to be careful. Don't forget where you came from. In other words, don't forget that one time you were lost. God saved this man right here. A wretched, low-down, no-good sinner. I was once just like them. Professing Christians. When I try to tell these false Christians out there and try to witness to them, I'm testifying, I was just like them. And i got to remember that if Jesus can save me, He can save them. Now today I agree most of them don't want to be saved. And the Bible talks about, hey, don't cast your, that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine. You're not a car salesman. I've always preached this. You're not a car salesman. You preach the truth to them. If they want it, praise the Lord. If they don't want it, go somewhere else and go somewhere to go to somebody who does want it, in other words. Okay. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in his mercy for his great love where he with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By Christ Jesus, see, by grace ye are saved. Six and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our soul can be in two places at once. It's here and it's up there. Mm -hmm. It's in heaven when you're saved. But here's the key. Why is that there? Why is that whole thing there for that? We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Verse 7. The people that sleep, the people that have died and their soul is fully in heaven right now. Not in two places, but just one place in heaven. Why? Verse 7. That in the ages to come, He might show His exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. What do I believe this is talking about? Two things. The catching away of the body of Christ. The world's going to see it. I believe the whole world's going to see it. It's not going to be an event that happens like that and everybody's going to be wondering what happened. Hmm, I don't know. What happened? We've already talked about this in that study about seven times caught up. Okay, our bodies are going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. We're going to go, this corruption, this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. That's going to happen in a second. Okay. But the ages to come. The other thing I believe it's talking about is 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Remember it said up there, it's showing the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. Right now we're two-thirds redeemed. We're not fully redeemed yet, brothers and sisters Christ. We still have to deal with this body of corruptible flesh. We're still struggling and fighting the law of sin today as a Christian. Sometimes the Holy Spirit gives us liberty from the law of sin and helps us overcome the law of sin. And there's sometimes where we ignore the Holy Spirit, we ignore the Word, and we fall into temptation and we choose to sin and we fall into the law of sin as a Christian. Okay. But there's going to come a time where we're going to be fully redeemed. I'm getting ahead of myself to the second part of the being caught up, the third salvation. But the first salvation in the life of a Christian is there's Christians in the past that have died, and they're now with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Their soul is up in heaven right now. Okay? They're with the brethren. Okay? There's two things, two ways that you die as a Christian. Okay? The first one is God kills you and brings you home. That's the first one. Okay? Um, like I said, there's chastening of the Lord. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. There's some people that get so messed up in their life and their walk with the Lord that they just are just so falling apart and their, their flesh is so falling apart that God goes enough and enough that He'll kill you and bring you home early. There's times where you're, you're an old man, you've been living in the faith for years and years and years, 
loving the Lord, living for the Lord, preaching the plan of salvation. You could be a man in ministry preaching the word for 50 years, and God goes, you know what? You fought the good fight. It's time to come home. And God will kill you and bring you home. Okay? The second way is being a martyr, where God allows you to die to be a testimony to the people. Okay? There's a lot of times where a martyr can lead someone, a lot of people to Christ. They don't take him seriously until after he dies for Jesus Christ. Then they take him seriously. But let's talk about some martyrs in the Bible. Turn to Acts 7.59. We always talk about all these apostles, you know, Paul and, and Peter and how they died for Jesus Christ. And it's like, um, I'd like to actually go through the Bible and see where the Bible shows people dying for Jesus Christ. So Acts 7.59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now you read that whole passage about Stephen. He's trying to preach to the Jewish people and they don't like it. You know, he's, he's doing it with love and everything, but it's almost like it's a situation where he's casting pearls before swine. That which is holy among the dogs. He tries to preach truth to them. They don't want the truth. And what do they do? They end up rending him to the point of killing him. Okay. There are times that you see, brethren, in life where you go to try to preach the truth to someone, it might be just the first time, and you learn the hard way and get rendered that that person didn't want the truth. They have no love of the truth. But you still do it because you have love for them. But there's a cost. Okay? Especially in these last days, there's a cost to preaching absolute truth. Um, we're getting censored on social medias, uh, on the internet. Um, we're getting told you can't do gospel tracting. I have to be secretive sometimes with my gospel tracting when I go to leave gospel tracts places because you'll get in trouble. Okay? We've got to do what we've got to do to preach the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. But Stephen, he was killed for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his stance for the Lord. Okay? Acts 8.2, we read and and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Lamentation over him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm not saying that you shouldn't uh, have sorrow for a brother or sister in Christ that was with us that's not with us anymore. They've passed away, they're with heaven, but that's something to celebrate, to praise the Lord for. He's in heaven right now, and we're going to see him again at the resurrection. We're going to see him again at the catching of the way of the body of Christ. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay. We have sorrow in our heart because we miss that brother in Christ or that sister in Christ. But remember where they are right now. They're in a far better place than we are. Okay. Paul even said himself, it's far better place. Mm -hmm. To be with Christ with is far better, but to be with you is needful. When someone goes home to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's because God wanted it to happen. There's not one brother or sister in Christ that dies and God goes, Oh, I didn't want that to happen. They're with the, our Lord and Savior. Right? It's where we want to be. Right? I don't condone, and I never will condone suicide. Why? Because my life is not my own. The Bible says your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. Okay? I'm here doing the work of the Lord until God says it's time to come home. He's the one that decides when we come home or not. I'm getting ahead of myself. That includes the catching away of the body of Christ. What about somebody else in the Bible that was martyred for Jesus Christ? Acts 12.1. Go ahead and turn to Acts 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John. You know, James and John that went up and saw Jesus being transfigured, and they saw Moses and Elijah talking with him. Okay. They killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Here we have another account of a martyr for Jesus Christ. We have, I have uh, John Huss. The, I have um, Flames in the Wind, the, the Christian movie where it talks about how the Catholic Church was killing people. There are millions of martyrs down through the centuries that were killed by the Catholic Church, by pagans, when they tried to preach truth, try to stand for truth, wanting something as simple as having the Word of God in their own hands, in their own language, where they could read it and understand it. There have been martyrs galore, brothers and sisters in Christ. 
But please take this that they're in heaven right now with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no better place to be. We're here right now because this is where God has us. This is where God wants us to work and do the work of the Lord. Live for Him. Be a light for Him. Be a light unto this, that shines in this dark world. And the world has never been darker than it is today. The door, we've always said in the past that the world is dark and the world is wicked and everything. I was talking to a brother and sister in Christ and in the last year I was just taken back by it how wicked the world has fallen in just one year. How wicked things have gotten out there in just one year. How they're going after our children. Not our children, Bible believing God, I mean children, period. Okay? They're messing children up with feminism. They're messing children up with sodomy. Uh, they're messing children up with rebellion, rebelling against God from a, a young age. Okay? All the way to the elderly. Sodomy, feminism, false gods. Rebelling against God, the wickedness that's out there. It's becoming like the days of Sodom and Egypt. We're so close. The catch, I believe the catching away of the body of Christ is so close, brothers and sisters of Christ. We need to keep doing the work of the Lord. The Bible talks about absent from the body, present with the Lord. Let's look into that real quick, because we're talking about the dead in Christ. That's who we're talking about right now. People who die and their soul gets caught up. And they're in a great place right now. But what does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Wherefore, we, therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. The Holy Spirit's in us, absolutely. But the Bible talks about there's going to come a day where we get to see Jesus face to face. Right now we are absent physically from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in heaven. Our bodies are down here. We're down here doing the work of the Lord. Verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. I want to stop here and not go off on too much of a tangent, but that's why there's different dispensations. Okay, Adam and Eve, Jesus was physically walking in the garden and talking with them. They could see him. Faith wasn't involved. It was works. And the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, when he comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, he's going to be physically ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. It's not going to be about faith. Uh, we'll get to one of the question and answers where they're talking about asking questions about the thousand year reign. And the mistake that brother is making is he makes it out like there's eternal security in that time period. There isn't. It's not about faith, it's about sight. You can see Jesus Christ. Everyone will have to travel to see him every year. Okay. But today we walk by faith, not by sight. We're absent from the Lord physically. We're down here. He's up in heaven preparing a place for us. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If they were not so, I would have told you. He's up there preparing a place for them. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Where did we read up there? For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Uh, of such one will I glory, yet not of myself will I glo not glory, but in my infirmities. He's glorifying in a man that gets to go to heaven. We read right here. But to be present with the Lord. Really rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's what we all desire. To be present with the Lord. Um, the, when Jesus was physically present on the earth there was people that he healed there was people he cast devils out that followed him they had that desire that they wanted to be present with the Lord and he was physically present at that time Okay, that's our desire brothers and sisters of Christ we present tense want to be with the Lord and we're gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself but we're getting to the point where I, we'll talk about the verses where our bodies just we're just, I forgot the word, but we'll get to it. But we just have this yearning in our body that's like aching when we're down here in this world. And we just want to be, we want that catching away of the body of Christ to happen. We want that new body. We want to be with the Lord face to face. Okay. Verse 9, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of the Lord. The dead in Christ, the Christians who sleep, that are present with the Lord, 
they're accepted of him. That's what we're, they live, they tried their hardest to live a life of Christ while they're down here on the earth, that while they're, they're up there, or whether we're down here, we're, we may be accepted of him. We're to continue to do the work of the Lord. We're to abound in the work of the Lord. I've said this many times, brother and sister Christ, are you falling flat on your face? Jesus could come back any day now. You know the biggest motivation to get you back up on your feet? Encouragement from the brethren, prayer from the brethren, the word of God's number one, conviction, that's all there. But you know my number one motivation to get back up when I am tempted, fall into temptation, or when my thoughts start to stray and God reels them back in? Because Jesus Christ can come back any day now. Is he going to come back and find me falling flat on my face? Is he going to find me doing wrong by the brethren? Being a bad example for the lost world? Not being a good example for Jesus Christ, but being a bad example to the lost world? What state is he going to find us in when he comes back? So when I fall, when I fall, because I still do sometimes, God, that's a great motivator to pick me back up. God could come back. I don't want God coming and finding me in a fallen state. And I know, brother and sister Christ, you don't want him coming and finding you in a fallen state. We want to be accepted of him. We want him looking at us saying, Well done, thou good and faithful one, faithful servant. 1 Corinthians 13, 9. 1 Corinthians 13, 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, for two-thirds redeemed. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Catching away the body of Christ. We'll be fully redeemed. We're no longer partly redeemed. We're going to be fully redeemed. Verse 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We're going to be putting away this wicked body of flesh someday, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's going to be a day that we're going to be put, have, not having to deal with this lost world right now, the way it is right now. We're going to come back. Some of us are going to be blessed to come back in a thousand year reign to rule with Jesus Christ and serve Him. But we're going to, there's going to be a point where we're going to be putting away the childish things that are going on, the fighting that's going on among the brethren, the wicked things that are going on in the world, the, 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 the sins that you struggle with, the addictions that you struggle with. We're going to be putting all that away. See, right now you struggle with the flesh to the day you die. Or the catching away of the body of Christ. Whichever one happens first. You're going to be struggling with the flesh. Okay? Verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. We're only two-thirds redeemed. We look through a glass darkly. Remember, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can you remember? Can you remember anything that's up there right now? Your soul is up there. But you can't remember what your soul's seeing up there. Why? Because we see through a glass darkly. But then... Face to face. Would we just read back there? Willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Face to face with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Verse 13. And now by faith, hope, charity, these three, but the grace of these three is charity. Okay. While we're down here, abounding in the grace of the Lord, we need to remember to keep having charity. But what are we looking for? We're going to live for the Lord until He kills us and brings us home. Or He calls us home through the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? So that's the first part I wanted to make very known, brothers and sisters Christ. When we have brothers and sisters in Christ that die, that physically die, and their soul goes to be in heaven, fully and completely in heaven, they're still not fully redeemed yet because they haven't got the incorruptible body, but they're in heaven. It's a wonderful thing for them to be there. Okay, Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's supposed to also give us courage, brothers and sisters, Christ to stand for what is right, for absolute truth, even if it costs us our lives, the martyr for Jesus Christ. You don't have to go out of your way to be killed for Jesus Christ. If that's what God wants for you, that's what's going to happen. But when that time comes, if it comes, brothers and sisters of Christ, that you have to actually put your life on the line and you're going to die for Jesus Christ, remember, absent from the body, present with the Lord. 
that being with the Lord Jesus Christ is a far better place to be than here on this earth. We're here on this earth doing the work of the Lord because that's what He wants. It's needful for the body of Christ. It's needful to get those souls saved, to lead those people to Christ so He can save them. Not me. He can save them because only He can. But ultimately, the salvation, the third salvation, ultimately, what is it? It's the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Even the dead in Christ shall rise. They will be fully redeemed. That's when they will get that body of incorruptible flesh. Their soul's in heaven waiting right now. Okay. So caught up in the body and soul. Let's get into that real quick. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep... But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, or fully redeemed. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, until that time happens, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay. i got to let her down because it is getting warm. <laughs> i got my sweater. But brothers and sisters in Christ, until we get caught up, whether God says it's time to come home and He kills you and brings you home, or we're waiting for the catching away of the body of Christ, we get to be blessed to be alive during that time period of the catching away of the body of Christ. Until that happens, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we're to continue living for Jesus Christ every day. But the salvation, that third salvation that's coming, that we're looking for, that we're hoping for, the blessed hope, is the catching away of the body of Christ. When God finally frees us from this body of flesh, He frees us from the law of sin. He frees us from this wicked world. We get to go be with Him face to face. Okay? Turn to 1 Thess Thessalonians 4.13. Incorruption. This corruption must put on incorruption. The dead in Christ shall rise first. First Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. Remember, they were very sorrowful and lamenting over um, Stephen. Sorry about that. Stephen, that ye sorrow not. Remember, he's in a better place. Even as others which have no hope, you sorrowful, you're more sorrowful for people, brothers and sisters in Christ are more sorrowful for family members that are lost, that when you know someone that dies that wasn't saved, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, where they ended up. People that have no hope. But the brothers and sisters of Christ that have died, they have hope. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of our Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That's why the dead in Christ rise first. 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord now, I've always taught this. People ask, well, clouds, what if, you, what if there's no clouds in the sky? If you listen to that study that, brother, uh, um, that the Lord taught me to preach to, to answer some of the questions of the brethren, I believe a cloud's going to form underneath the feet of all the dead in Christ, and they're going to rise, start heading up, and then we get changed, and the cloud's going to form us. Remember, a cloud is a, is a physical manifestation of the glory of the Lord. Fire, cloud, and light are the three physical today, physical manifestations of the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is going to bring us home. And as we rise up, if there's no clouds in the sky, there will be after that happens. 
But what are we supposed to do when life here gets so tough and we see how wicked the world's getting, how bad it's getting out there, how close we're getting? Verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope this study is a comfort to you to know that no matter how bad it's getting out there, that someday you're going to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm going to be with the Lord, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're going to see Him face to face, whether we're caught up in soul or we're caught up in body and soul. We're going to be with our Lord and Savior someday. You don't have to put up, <laughs> brothers and sisters Christ, we don't have to put up with this wicked body of flesh for all eternity, and we don't have to put up with this wicked world for all eternity. It's just a small blink in the time of history that we have to put up with this. And we do it for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, for, we're supposed to continue, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. We're suffering for Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say? If you suffer for Him, you shall also reign with Him. Right. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1. It's a, it's a thing, of, we comfort one another with these words. It's a blessed hope. And sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes you can get so focused on that blessed hope, you forget to keep abounding in the work of the Lord. You become stagnant, and you forget to, to abound in the work of the Lord. Until that happens, God's got it planned out. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself again. We're going to get to the verse where it talks about how we're supposed to patiently wait for it. We're not supposed to be sitting here twiddling our thumbs, not doing the work of the Lord, saying, Lord, why aren't you here? Lord, why aren't you? You start questioning God. We're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be patiently waiting for it. And while we're patiently waiting for it, we're supposed to be abounding in the work of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. The catching away of the body of Christ has to happen. The time of Jacob's trouble has to happen, so the day of Christ can happen. The thousand year reign, the rule of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Okay. That's why it talks about, do not be soon shaken in mind and troubled, neither in spirit, nor by word, nor by letter that's from us. We're being warned that there's a great falling away in the body of Christ today. And as, as it, I get depressed, but the Bible word is sorrows. Are you very sorrowful about seeing brethren fall away? Right? Brethren disappear. What happened to them? All I can do is pray for them. I don't know what happened to them. We see brethren fall away. Right? Brethren just disappear. Right. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. We're going to see a falling away in the body of Christ, then we're going to have the catching away of the body of Christ. We're going to read the verse that says that he who now letteth. The, this does, the falling away happens before the, the catching away. The catching away happens, then the, sin of, son of, sin, the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What's going to be holding? We're going to get to it. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let the church, the body of Christ, until he be taken out of the way. The catching away of the body of Christ. Uh, the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which remain shall be caught up with them, but we're all going to be changed. The dead in Christ and those which are still alive, we're going to be changed in a moment in a blink of an eye. Corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. Death wears thy victory. We're going to be fully redeemed someday, and it's going to happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 8, And when, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of the coming. The end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Jesus comes down, we get to ride down with him, and he wipes out that 200 million man army, and he bounds Satan and throws him in the bottomless pit. Verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. God's going to deal with this lost world. He's got every, the pieces are all moving together, He's got everything under control. We need to trust that God knows what He's doing. 
We need to continue to abound in the work of the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ. Continue, continue to abound in the work of the Lord. But remember that blessed hope, brothers and sisters of Christ, that third salvation that we're waiting for, where we're going to get fully redeemed. We get to go be with the Lord face to face. So no matter how bad life gets for you, depressed that you get from this world, how depressed, I'm sorry, sorrows from this world, how the vexation, um, Jesus was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, how grieved you are by how wicked this world's getting, how grieved you are by the brethren, the fight, the fighting that's going on among the brethren, um, the falling away, people are falling away. We have that blessed hope. There's going to be a day that we're all going to be together. And we're all going to be face to face with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 8, 16. Remember when I mentioned patiently waiting for it. Where does that say that in the Bible? We're supposed to patiently wait for it. There's times where I, I have to apologize to the Lord because I'm always like, Lord, why haven't you come yet? Look how wicked it is. They're going out. The children are being perverted. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, it's like Egypt out there. All these false gods left and right. All these counterfeit Jesuses. You know, the Antichrist spirit is just hardcore. The One World Order is already pretty much set up. The nations, uh, the Jesuit Order has infiltrated all these false religions, all these nations. Catholicism is just ran, running rampant. And we're, I'm like, Lord, why haven't you come yet? And when the moment I say that, the Lord convicts me with these verses that we're going to read. Do you, it's, he's like, it's like he's asking me, do you trust me? I know what I'm doing. Do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I trust you. You know what you're doing. Please forgive me, Lord. I'm just looking forward to it, Lord. I'm just really, really looking forward to it, and I really want to be with you, Lord. And he knows we do. He's not just sitting up there going, I wonder if they want to come home or not. He knows, okay, the burden's on our heart to come be with him. Romans 8, 16. The capital S Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Lord, we... Brothers and sisters of Christ, we have that blessed hope. We're going to be fully redeemed someday, and we're going to be with our Lord and Savior. And the Holy Spirit in you keeps reminding you, brothers and sisters Christ, just is reminding me that we're looking forward to that day. Verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. If we suffer with Him. If we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. We get to come back with Him and for the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Future tense. But notice what it said there. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Brothers, this Christ, what we have to go through down here is nothing compared to what awaits us. Incorruptible body, immortality, getting to live forever serving our Savior, and getting to be face to face with Jesus Christ. Face to face with our Creator. Okay? What we have to go through down here is nothing. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think it's just everything's falling apart and it's just like, I just want to give up. But it's nothing compared to what's waiting for us. God will pick you back up if you let Him and get you back onto the right path and continue to abounding in the work of the Lord, being steadfast, being unmovable, and get back to doing the work of the Lord. He's done it for me. He'll do it for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. The glory that will be revealed in us. What is that glory? Let's keep reading. That shall be future tense. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Remember we talked about this. The sons of God... Or when we become as the angels. Jesus said we'll be as the angels in heaven. Uh, the Old Testament, sons of God, is always a reference to angels. And the New Testament says, now are we the sons of God. Verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage, delivered from the bondage, shall be. Future tense shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's the glory. When we get freed from this body of wicked flesh, the law of sin has no dominion in our life whatsoever anymore. That's that glorious liberty that's talking about. 
children of God, 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation has to deal with this wicked body of flesh, saved and lost. What's the difference? We read about it, about the people who sleep. We have hope. They don't. We have hope that someday God is going to change us. He's going to fully redeem us. We're not going to have to deal with this wicked body of flesh forever. Okay. We have a blessed hope. They do not. But they're groaning just like we are. Verse 23, And not only, our, not only they, but ourselves also. So that, that's how we know. It's not just talking about the lost world. It's talking about both lost and saved. We all groan because we have to deal with this body of flesh. It grows old. There's that side of it. It grows old. It falls apart. Which have the ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to be fully redeemed. We're sealed, the Bible says we're sealed unto the day of redemption. We haven't been fully redeemed yet. But that day's coming, brother and sister Christ. To wit the redemption of our body. Has that happened yet? That's how we know this glorious liberty is not talking about. I used to use this wrong. I used to apply this glorious liberty to today, and it's not for today. It's what's going to happen at the catching away of the body of Christ. We have liberty today, but we don't have glorious liberty. That glory that shall be revealed in us. Let's keep reading. Here we see the wit, the redemption of our bodies. Has our bodies been redeemed yet? No. That's how we know this is a future event. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? Verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we patiently wait for it. We're patiently waiting for that glorious liberty. We're patiently waiting for the catching away of the body of Christ. We're patiently waiting for it. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, there's nothing wrong with sitting there. I do it all the time. I ask the Lord. I said, Lord, is today the day? Oh, Lord, I do wish I could come be with you. I just long to be with you, Lord, face to face. But be careful in the falling into the trap where you start questioning God. Why haven't you come yet, Lord? Look how bad it is out there. Why haven't you come yet? You're not having faith and trusting God that He knows what He's doing. He's got everything timed out perfectly. He's going to come in His time. Okay, do I believe we're getting close? Absolutely. But we're supposed to patiently wait for it. Patiently wait for it. Remember that, brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 1. The catch away of the body of Christ is going to happen someday. That's the third salvation. When you're saved and you're focusing hardcore on salvation in this life, to live for the Lord, to abound in the work of the Lord, to be steadfast, to be unmovable, to make sure that you're not fainting, you're not faltering, you're not falling flat on your face, there's something that helps us get through all that. And that's that blessed hope. We're looking forward to the catching away of the body of Christ. We're looking forward to someday being with our Lord and Savior, even if it means just being caught up in soul. Of fought the good fight, you're an old man in Christ, and God kills you and says, it's time to come home, brother. It's time to come home, sister. You fought the good fight. We have hope. The lost world does not. There's supposed to be a difference in how we live and how we act as Christians in the lost world. No matter how bad it's getting out there, we're not given to fear. That's why we don't have fear, brothers and sisters of Christ. Remember the Bible says that we're not given to fear? We're not given to a spirit of fear talking about fearing what's going on in the world, but of power and love and a sound mind. Because no matter what happens in this world, we know we get to be with our Lord and Savior someday. God's got everything under control. It's His will that's going on. Okay. He gets free will. There's that. But everything that's going on, God's allowing it to happen, and it's His will. Romans 7, 1. Therefore, I'm sorry, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the liberty that we have today. We're free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It's at that point you become sealed into the day of redemption. When you get saved and God frees you, liberates you from the law of sin and death, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That blessed hope that we're looking forward to. You're sealed. Okay. But that glorious liberty, what is that glorious liberty freeing you from? I know we talked about this before, but I want to go over it again. Romans chapter 7, verse 22. Turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Notice it says bringing me into captivity. There's times that the Holy Spirit will help liberate you from that law of sin in this life. He helped, the Holy Spirit comes in and God cleans up your life and helps you fight that law of sin. But notice he says, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. It's still there. We still have this wicked flesh that we're fighting, which is in my members. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Jesus Christ will, at the catching away of the body of Christ. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I may serve the law of God. What do we read back there? It says, keep abounding in the work of the Lord, be steadfast, unmovable. The Bible talks about not fainting, not faltering. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay, with my mind I may serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What's that glorious liberty? That our body's groaning, our, our soul is groaning because it's having to fight and struggle with this body of flesh all the time. But there's going to come a day where that struggle is going to be gone. No more struggling. We're going to give, be given an incorruptible flesh that's going to be in line with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're going to be like Him. We're going to see Him face to face. 1 Corinthians 15.54 Turn to 1 Corinthians 15.54 I want to read that again. That law of sin that we're going to be freed from, I just really want to drive this home. That glorious liberty, what is that? So when, so when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Fully redeemed. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law of sin. 57. But thanks be to God which giveth victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to call us home one day. That's that third salvation that we're looking for, brothers and sisters Christ. Don't forget it. But don't get so focused on it in the sense that you're not abounding in the work of the Lord. Do both. This is one of those times where I'll actually say, do both. Make sure that you're keeping your eyes to that blessed hope to keep... Renewing your spirit day by day to remember that blessed hope, that future event that hasn't happened yet, as you're abounding in the work of the Lord. Okay. Now, like I said, this is not regular liberty, being freed from the law of sin and death. That's regular liberty, when we get sealed unto the day of redemption. But liberty in its complete form. Remember that when it says glorious liberty in that passage, it's liberty in its complete form. We've been our soul and our spirit's been liber liberated, but our body hasn't. We're only two thirds redeemed. Okay. Someday we're going to have glorious liberty. We're going to be fully and completely redeemed. How many of the brothers and sisters in Christ out there can say Amen? Amen. 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 I'm sick and tired of this flesh. I'm sick and tired of seeing brethren fall away. I'm sick and tired of this wicked world trying to preach truth to people that don't want the truth. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm looking forward to that blessed hope. And then you get asked, so are you going to quit preaching to the world? No, I'm going to keep preaching to the world. I'm going to keep abounding in the work of the Lord. But that sorrow, and a uh, man of sorrow is crammed with grief, the vexation you have from this world, we're not going to have to put up with it forever, brothers and sisters of Christ. Okay? We're going to have glorious liberty someday. Liberty in its complete form. Face to face with our Savior. 1 John chapter 3, chapter 2. I want to read a verse again. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. 
We're going to be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And the thing is, is when I say see Him face to face with our Savior, I want to make the point that, brothers and sisters of Christ, we get to see all the brethren and be together and see them face to face too. Think about that. Brethren of the past, we always talk about, I'd love to meet Paul, I'd love to... What about the brothers of today that we don't get to see face to face? We're so spread thin, we're so spread out, but there's going to come a day, because I always push this, I'd love to have a house church, I'd love to have physical fellowship with some of the brethren, and I believe the body of Christ sometimes is a big de desire to come together. Um, but the ultimate gathering together of the brethren is going to be at the catching away of the body of Christ. We're going to see Jesus Christ face to face, but we're going to get to see our brothers and sisters in Christ face to face. No more millions of miles apart. No more walls between us. I'm talking about countries, different laws that are, you know, bad laws and whatnot. No. Not even this body of flesh is going to get between us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all going to be together face to face. So that, my brother and sister Christ, is the third, the third salvation in this three-part series. That third salvation is we're going to get to be with our Lord and Savior. If you get caught up before the catching away, your soul gets caught up. I just really wanted to put that in there, and that's a better place to be than to be here. But if you're here, it's because God wants you here, and there's work to be done. But that catching away, when that catching away happens, we're all leaving. The work is done. Okay. So what are we supposed to do right now? I've got you pointed and looking at that blessed hope. What are we supposed to do right now? We're to get busy for the Lord. We're supposed to abound in the Lord. We need to get that last soul saved, brothers and sisters of Christ. I can't push it enough that now more than ever, there's, for at least in America, there's a window of opportunity. I'm able to go now and go back to doing a lot of the gospel tracting where I leave gospel tracts everywhere. I try to hand them out a little bit here and there. But the doors are opening a little bit before they slam shut again. We need to be getting out there and, pre and preaching the plan of salvation and getting those gospel tracts out everywhere. I'm not allowed to walk into these buildings without masks for right now. But I, I said, I, think, I believe come November, October, November, this next flu season, they're going to slam the door shut again, try to shut down buildings again. They're going to try to put, make people wear masks again. Okay. But now is the time to be preaching. Okay, now is the time to be preaching and teaching. The plan of salvation, the ministry of reconciliation. Second Corinthians chapter five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away; behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Him by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto Him. Notice it says that God was in Christ, the soul is in the body. And another uh, Godhead verse. Trespass unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you really wanting to go home? Are you desperate, desperate to go home? You want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? You want that catch in the way the body of Christ happens? Instead of us questioning God, why isn't He come? Why aren't we busting our butt to get that last soul saved? Get out there, throw gospel tracts everywhere, hand gospel tracts everywhere. Build up the courage to preach the true plan of salvation to all your family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors. Trying to get that last soul saved. Remember, brothers and sisters in Christ, um, someone explained it to me, the, how the harvest is supposed to be. When Paul was going around, that's the first fruits. You saw a lot of the, when you're, I got trees right now, you got first fruits. A lot of fruit pops up. That's Paul's time. Uh, if you guys remember the movie Sheffy, uh, you can look it up online, the movie Sheffy. In his time period, I believe, when the King James Bible came out, uh, that gave a translation that the whole world would wind up using. This King James Bible came out. That's when God's Word went all over the world. That's when you saw so many people get saved. That was the main harvest. And someone has to keep reminding me what we're in today is the gleanings. What does that mean? That means we're 
I'm going to do an example. I see this fruit tree, I walk by, and I try to examine that fruit tree top to bottom. We're at the end of the season, and I can't find any fruit on it, and I walk away. Brother Brian comes by, he looks at that tree, can't find any fruit, and he examines it hard. He's really trying to preach the gospel to the lost world. So am I. Uh, Brother JT comes by, doesn't find anything. And I, I use this just as an example. Um, so for the Sisters in Christ, to leave, you can leave gospel tracts places too, leave them everywhere. But let's say you have someone, Sister Catherine, Brother Brian's wife, she's looking for uh, mushrooms, and she's always leaving gospel tracts places, but she's looking for a mushroom at the foot of the tree, and she looks up, and boom, there's an apple right there. And God lets her lead that last soul to Christ, and boom, we get rushed up. Uh, there's other sisters in Christ out there, you know. You can be leaving out gospel tracts places too and handing people gospel tracts. Absolutely. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we're in the gleanings. We're looking desperately for that last fruit and trying to find that last fruit. Imagine yourself that you're in this huge valley that's like, let's say, thousands of acres. And there's fruit trees everywhere. And you're told there's one piece of fruit down there somewhere. you got to go find it. That's a lot of work, and you look at it going, really? i got to go through a million fruit trees to find that one fruit tree that has one fruit on it? That's what we're in right now, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're in the last days. Okay, We're trying to preach to people. Uh, a lot of people have a uh, false sense of who Jesus is because they're being preached a false Jesus. We're having to deal with people with a high level of pride that are going about to establish their own righteousness trying to preach the truth when someone's already come along and perverted the truth. Okay. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 17. I read this last night and I want to end this study with this as encouragement. Okay. 1 John 4, 17. Well, let's start in 16. And we have known that believe that love that God hath to us, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may be bold, have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. The judgment seat of Christ, the catch away the body of Christ, then we have the judgment seat of Christ, that we may have boldness. We always talk about being scared, and I do, brothers and sisters of Christ. I've made mistakes in my past. I've, As a newly saved Christian, I was falling all over myself left and right, struggling with the flesh and making a mess of Scripture sometimes. Um, but brothers and sisters of Christ, we need to keep abounding in the work of the Lord. Make sure you're starting every day with the Word of God. Make sure you're ending every day with the Word of God. Okay? Make sure you're... Uh, preaching the plan of salvation. Make sure you're still working on that sanctification. Why? You're, we're desperately, desperately, as a brother in Christ, I'm desperately trying to encourage you to do what God is doing for me. To let God do for you what He's doing for me. Cleaning up my life and helping me live a life of Christ so that on that day of judgment, I can have boldness. You want boldness on that day of judgment or do you want to be sitting there scared stiff because a lot of the stuff that you've been just failing the Lord, living after the flesh, and justifying sin, you're going to have to answer for that at the judgment seat of Christ. You want boldness? Continue abounding in the work of the Lord. While we're looking for that blessed hope, the third salvation, that glorious liberty that shall appear, that we patiently wait for it, okay, to become sons of God, fully redeemed, make sure you're abounding in the work of the Lord. So that someday that you can have boldness in the day of judgment. So I want to end this with grace and peace. Grace and peace. And I mean that, brothers and sisters Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Especially in these last days. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus. I'm preaching this out of love. Not If it convicts some of the brethren, praise the Lord. But I'm not doing it out of hate. I'm not doing it out of bitterness. I'm not doing it out of anger. My love for you. My love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.